Good day, everyone. My name's Ebony Bennett. I'm Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to our Economics of a Pandemic webinar series. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I live and work, Canberra's Ngunnawal country, and sovereignty was never ceded and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and ask that we all recommit ourselves to the Uluru Statement from the Heart and the process of securing a voice to Parliament uh, and a Makarata Commission that can make agreement making and treaty making as well as a facilitating a truth telling process about Australia's history. Uh, since we began these uh, webinar series in March, more than 20,000 people have registered for one of these webinars. So I want to thank you all for your support. Um, and just to say that we aim to continue putting these on for free, um, but that they aren't free to put on for us. So we're in the middle of our end of financial year appeal right now. And if you can, if you're in the position to, uh, if you could go to tai.org.au forward slash donate uh, and chuck a few dollars towards our end of financial year appeal, we'd be incredibly grateful. Just a few tips before we begin today to help things run smoothly. Uh, for those of you, I'm sure you've all been on many Zoom calls uh, by now, but if you're new to this, if you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should be able to see a Q&A function where you can ask questions of our panelists. And you should hopefully also be able to upvote questions and make comments on other people's questions. We will take questions in the second half direct to our panelists. And if you'd like to ask your question live on air, there's a raise your hand function and a little hand emoji pops up beside your name and I can call on you in the second half. And lastly, this discussion is being recorded and we'll send you all a copy afterwards um, uh, where you can watch it if you have to duck out or if you've otherwise missed it. Um, so since March, since the pandemic uh, really began, the Australia Institute has conducted quite a lot of detailed research on fiscal policy measures that we've already released, including, including um, you know, research that looks at the merits or otherwise of a public sector wage freeze in New South Wales, um, the impact of jo doubling job seeker, which is um, basically to raise it to the poverty level. But we really wanted to take a step back and look at the big picture because we're really entering um, the economic recovery period now where the government's trying to kickstart the economy again. And obviously the pandemic has created an unprecedented economic disruption and plunged Australia into its first recession in 30 odd years. I mean, at one point during the crisis, the Australian government was spending you know, about $20 billion a day. So things that once seemed politically impossible uh, at times seem to happen overnight. And so our chief economist, Richard Dennis, has written the Reconstruction Memorandum, which the Australia Institute is launching today along with a video that I'll play for you shortly. And what the memo really does is to look at the big picture and what are some of the principles um, and the shared principles that we should have and to guide us as we forge our economic recovery. So welcome Richard Dennis and welcome Richie Merzian, Director of our Climate and Energy Program. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Eb. Um, so I'll just outline what these principles are um, really before we get started. And that is firstly to put people first. Obviously millions of Australians are suffering from a lack of work and a lack of income. And there's lots of things that the government can do to fix that. To manage the economy and not the budget. Basically there's no point building a budget surplus on the back of broken families and broken communities. The third principle is to deliver bang for buck. Um, if we're thinking about all the different ways to spend public money, what are the ones that give us the best return and the most lasting community benefits? Uh, lasting benefits is the next principle. Uh, what are the things that we can be uh, spending our money on and building more of that are going to create economic growth and create a lasting benefit for the community that will, that will go for decades to come? The fifth principle is having clear criteria and democratic accountability. And the final principle is uh, recommitting to a voice to parliament, a process of treaty and agreement making and truth telling. 
uh, because uh, obviously that's a huge and important part of Australia's future going forward. And there's really no reason uh, that we can't be recommitting to that work right now. So Richard, first to you, I want to start with that last principle first. Um, obviously, there's, we're in a period of huge economic disruption, uh, but is that any reason why we shouldn't be uh, you know, responding and recommitting to the Uluru Statement from the heart? No, absolutely not. And, and let's be clear, for, for 29 years, the economy has grown steadily. For 29 years, uh, we, we never saw a recession. And for 29 years, our parliament didn't find time uh, to, to embrace these challenges. Uh, and it, it, it's, 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 it's wrong, it's obscene to, to now turn an economic crisis into an excuse or yet another excuse. Uh, for, for, for pushing such an important issue further back in the agenda. We've had 29 years of relative prosperity to say, what kind of country do we want to be? Uh, what else do we want to do? Now, here we are in the middle of a recession to, to say, oh, that's why we never got around to doing it. And that's why we have to delay the process that the government had already committed itself to is obscene. The, the nation state is big enough and capable enough to have more than one conversation at a time. Um, we, we saw that uh, having a debate about equal marriage didn't cause a recession. Um, we've, we've gone to war uh, and, and managed to talk, what, talk about the economy when we needed to. The, the whole idea that the only important thing for us to talk about is the economy and everything else is somehow a distraction from that uh, is, well, it's, it's, it's obviously untrue, but uh, for, for a government that says, well, we want to leave things to the market, well, how can they be so busy leaving things to the market that they don't actually have time to embrace things that, that only Parliament can address? Um, and Richard, just to, I guess, take us to that big picture, what is the, the reason why we need something like the reconstruction memo? At what kind of point in history does Australia find itself? Well, we find ourselves heading towards the biggest recession in, in modern Australian history, uh, probably the biggest recession that we've had since the Great Depression. Um, nothing that has been debated in our parliament or in our public life for the next, for the last 10 or 20 years, nothing that we've planned for or discussed uh, helps us to, to, to chart a course out of this. So the, the, the enormity of the recession can't be overstated. To be clear, the 1991 recession saw GDP fall by 1.5%. The 91 recession, 1.5% caused mass unemployment that lasted for a decade. Well, this recession is variously estimated to be anywhere from 5 to 10% of GDP. It's three to five times bigger than the last recession we had. Imagine you're at the beach and you got knocked over by a wave and then someone said the next wave coming is three to five times that big. Well, that's what, that's what Treasury, that's what the Reserve Bank, uh, that's what the IMF and the OECD think is heading our way. So the size of the recession is bigger than anything that we've ever had to deal with. And the government's already committed to public spending on a scale that was unimaginable before the last election, let alone at any point in modern history. And we need a plan for that. I keep saying it to people and uh, I fear people don't take me literally when I say this, but I urge everyone to take me literally. We're about to spend hundreds of billions of dollars more than we were planning to. Hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars. What we spend them on is up to us. The government agrees. The federal government agrees that that's what they're going to do. The state government agrees that that's what they're going to do. The, the, the you know, big end of town is calling on the government to do this because anyone with customers doesn't want all their customers to be broke or unemployed. So again, we are going to spend hundreds of billions of dollars. That is going to happen. We have to have a democratic debate about on what, and that's why I've tried to spell out these criteria. There's no one thing we should do. There's no one thing we should do. But with hundreds of billions, we can do anything. We can't do everything, but in 10 years' time, we get to look back and wonder how we spent that. Well, 
I'd, I'd rather shape that conversation now as, as I'm sure would everyone that's tuned in today. Yeah, so I want to start with the first principle, which I think is probably the most obvious, but not always evident in policy making, which is to put people first. Now, that sounds rather obvious, but what would that look like in practice, Richard? Well, if we're putting people first, uh, it means we're not putting the economy first. Um, now, as an economist, I always get a bit confused and surprised when people talk about the economy. We talk about what the economy needs or what the economy wants, or we talk about it as this abstract thing. Well, all the economy is, Australia's economy, often measured in gross domestic product GDP, all that is, is literally the sum of everything I did, you did, and everyone else out there watching did. When you add what 25 million people together bought, sold, earned, spent, saved, when you add it all up, that's the economy. But so much of our public debate isn't about, well, what does Ebony need? What does Richard need? What does a person who's lost their job in tourism in North Queensland need? Like, rather than talk about who's been affected and, and, and what they need and what we could do to help them, instead of having that concrete, specific conversation, we have this bizarre, abstract conversation about what the economy needs, you know, and it involves things like the economy needs us to be more competitive or the economy needs us to be more productive. Well, Woolworths just announced it's going to lay off a 1,000 workers and replace them with robots, okay? That's what Woolworths is doing right now to become more productive. So becoming more productive means sacking a thousand people. Is that what the economy needs right now? I don't think so. Is it what any of those displaced workers need? No. So we've got to put people first. We did that with the health dimension of this crisis and some people criticized it. I said, imagine a rich country putting human health ahead of a statistical indicator. You know, who, who are these freaks? Well, we did it. It was the right thing to do. And congratulations to the state and federal governments that made those decisions. But we need to take that same approach with our recovery. We need to ask who's been affected. What do they need? What tools do we have? Uh, what are the options for us to help those people? Because if we help the people, we're helping the economy. The economy is just the sum of us. Um, the next point is about managing the economy and not just the budget. Um, Richard, I'll come to you in a second um, to talk about the budget surplus and why that's kind of a, a meaningless uh, aim. But Richie Merzian, if I can ask you, it strikes me that climate change is obviously um, going to require a, a, an economic transition and it does impact whole sections of the economy. How important is it to put climate change at the centre of uh, these big economic decisions that we're making at the moment? Sure. <clears throat> I mean, where, you know, it seems like a, a years since we had the black summer bushfires while they're only a few months away uh, and with summer only a few months away from here now, it's a good reminder that there's a, a much bigger crisis, a more uh, long-term, um, far more, you know, uh, larger in terms of impacts uh, crisis looming. And if we are going to be spending hundreds of billions of dollars, it's a rare opportunity to actually address both. Um, and we're seeing more, many examples of this overseas uh, from other industrialized countries using this opportunity to build back better, to actually integrate uh, in their energy systems, in their transport systems, the kind of climate considerations that, that, that can tick both boxes. So if we are going on this journey, then it just makes sense uh, to go down this path, to listen to the same, um, the same caliber of experts who are recommending this direction. Uh, and, but unfortunately, and, and Richard mentions this in, in his memorandum, currently the government's taking advice from corporate executives. And I think Richard has this great line in there, which I'm going to repeat verbatim because I, I really dig it. Um, we have corporate CEOs demanding lower wages for their workers, lower taxes for themselves, and less regulation for their activities. And these corporate executives are being placed in this National COVID-19 Coordination Commission, uh, which has been handpicked by the Prime Minister's office to provide the advice for how we should be spending these billions of dollars going forward. Gas executives 
um, handpicked to, to shape this direction. And that's the real risk when you have this abstract concept of the economy and you have corporate executives with clear private interests that aren't necessarily um, public or human centric, then you could be putting yourself in a real pickle when it comes to the climate crisis, uh, as well as you know, poorly managing this current one. Um, so, Richard, um, one of the other points that you were making with that uh, principle is that the idea of just going back towards a budget surplus uh, is, is useless if it's built on the back of, you know, people on New Start remaining in poverty. Can you just talk me through why a budget surplus isn't an end in itself and, and why it's such a bad idea, particularly right now? Yeah, look, once upon a time, you know, we'll say PC, pre-Costello, uh, once upon a time when we talked about managing the economy, we talked about a, quite a complex system and uh, we wanted to get the labour market in balance, which meant low unemployment. We wanted inflation to be not too high and not too low. We used to worry about the current account deficit and we used to also, and we worried about productivity growth. And we worried a bit about government spending. But Peter Costello came along and said, ah, forget that. I've got one job. I've got one job. All I need to do is, is collect more tax from you every year than I spend and run a budget surplus. And that's me done. So it was really you know, quite a feat of politics to do this. It had nothing to do with economics. But we transformed the national debate into if the budget is in surplus, the government is a good economic manager. And surplus is a nice word. And, you know, who, 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 who doesn't want to have a surplus? Who doesn't want to have an abundance? But again, to be clear, and I talked about this with Stephanie Kelton on, on, on one of our webinars recently, when a government's promising to run a budget surplus, it is literally promising to collect more from us in tax than it spends on us on health and education and other services. Not only is that economically weird, but politically, how did they turn that into an attribute? Vote for me and I promise to collect more from you in tax than I will give to you on your services. And I will sit on a pile of your money and tell everyone what a good economic manager I am. How ridiculous. And, and of course the government, you know, Tony Abbott from opposition said we had a budget emergency. You know, he promised vote for me and we'll, you know, we'll pay down the debt. Well, Tony Abbott doubled the debt. No one cared. Um, uh, Obama, uh, Obama paid down deficits, uh, sorry, paid down the debt by uh, trying to run smaller uh, surplus, sorry, smaller deficits than, than the Republicans had run. Donald Trump comes in, introduces enormous tax cuts uh, and, and, and delivers the, the biggest deficits in American history. No one cares. No one's worried that Trump's running a deficit. It's, it's only when progressives might run a deficit uh, that, that the right goes into, uh, does cartwheels. It's so, so concerned. So the idea that a surplus is the be all and end all has nothing to do with economics. We don't mind, the business community doesn't mind when conservatives run budget deficits. Uh, the world doesn't care that Trump runs an enormous deficit. So yeah, when I say manage the economy, not the budget, the budget is a tool. It, 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 the budget is just the document that kind of collates all of our spending ideas and all of our revenue ideas and puts them all in one document. Anyone that's ever bought a house has run an enormous budget deficit. That doesn't make them irresponsible. Right? If you're spending more money than you're earning today, but you're buying things that will deliver benefits for decades to come, that's not reckless, that's responsible. Yet we've told ourselves that if the government used this crisis to go out and spend tens of billions of dollars, which by the way isn't a lot, tens of billions of dollars on renewable energy and energy efficiency, not only would it create jobs instantly, but at the end of the crisis, we'd all have lower uh, power bills and we'd reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So, Well, Richard, that brings me to the next point, which is bang for our buck. So how much does uh, a project like energy efficiency for social, house, social and community housing or investment in renewable infrastructure, how does that stack up against um, other projects that the government might spend money on uh, in terms of bang for our buck, what does that mean? 
Yeah, so bang for the buck means, so we agree we're going to spend hundreds of billions of dollars. That's great. We're just haggling over on what? And, and we, can, we can do literally anything we want with that money. Who, who'd have thought that the coalition would double unemployment benefits, uh, pay people to not work, and literally just post enormous checks to businesses and say, this should help your cash flow. We can do anything we want with it. The government's come out recently and said they've got a $72 billion uh, construction infrastructure pipeline. $72 billion, here's some stuff we're gonna build. Great, we can do anything. But we need to worry as much about the shape of the stimulus as the size. In the same way, I think we should worry far more about the shape of our economy and not its size. So when we spend a million dollars on something like health or education, we create around 10 jobs. When we, create, when we spend a million dollars on something like construction, we create about one and a half jobs. So 10 jobs per million in the services sector, one and a half jobs per million in the construction sector. Now, if we're trying to create jobs, if that was actually our number one objective, if we were trying to create jobs, then we'd get bang for our buck by spending the money in the labor intensive industries. But while the government talks about jobs, what it's actually doing is spending money on projects that won't create a lot of jobs. Doesn't mean it's a terrible idea to build a road or a bridge. We just know that that won't create a lot of jobs. And more importantly, we know that building a road or a bridge will do nothing to create jobs for the hundreds of thousands of people whose skills are in retail or tourism or hospitality or food preparation. There is no chance, none whatsoever, that in the short or even the medium term, most of the people that lost their jobs uh, thanks to the corona crisis are going to get jobs in, re in, in construction. Now, if we go and build renewable energy, you bet we'll create more jobs installing solar on roofs than we will if we, for example, build a coal-fired power station. So, uh, but we wouldn't get as many jobs putting solar on as we would employing more aged care workers. There's no one thing we need to do. That's the point. There's no one right thing to spend money on. But all of the things we spend money on, I think we have to apply those criteria. Are we putting people first? Are we managing the economy? Are we getting bang for our buck? And, you know, are we getting lasting benefits? Um, so speaking of the lasting benefits, Richie Merzian, um, obviously... Uh climate change is a really long-term uh, policy problem, but it's really urgent that we solve it right now. And in the, um, in the memorandum, Richard talks about the lasting benefits um, being not only doing government spending on things we need more of, but things that will be creating economic growth and perhaps even joy for the whole public uh, for many years after it has ceased creating the jobs uh, at the time that we, we do the spending. How important is shifting our economy away from fossil fuels to deal with climate change? What kind of lasting benefits is that going to have? Uh, it has a number of co-benefits beyond the obvious around emissions reductions in terms of air pollution uh, and in terms of basically cost as well. Um, the energy sector, if you look at it as both electricity and transport make up the majority of Australia's emissions. And apart from the electricity sector, you know, emissions have been generally... And so this is how we address that. <laughs> Lasting benefits, including better air quality as well. Less <laughs> um, so th there's, a lot of, there's a lot of good things that will flow out of this. But at the end of the day, what you need is, is an actual climate and energy policy. And that's what we're missing. Um, all the government's given us in this space is a technology roadmap without a destination. Uh, there is no long-term target for Australia beyond 2030. The current 2030 target is quite weak. Um, and, and the government's main plan to, to reach that is using these legally baseless Kyoto credits, which will do the majority of, of its work. So when it comes to the climate front, there's very little going on when there's a lot of benefit that, that could be derived from that space. And a good example is just transport. Uh, Australia's transport emissions are going up because there's nothing that's going on in that sector to address them. Australia is highly reliant on fossil fuels um, for its transport sector. 90% of that is imported. So there's a fuel security problem as well. Electrifying transport ticks so many boxes. It would create a whole bunch of jobs. 
it would potentially integrate um, more opportunities like taking a lot of the mining of rare earths and manufacturing those things we need here. Um, and it would reduce emissions in, in a sector that just continues to climb. Uh, so lots of good things could flow from it. We just need to position ourselves to take them up. Um, and Richard, I wonder if I might ask you, uh, and I think I've put you on mute there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, there's a flip side to that as well. The government's talked a lot about a gas-fired, a gas-led recovery, uh, and that could deliver lasting damage that lasts for decades as well, couldn't it? Oh, look, absolutely. Apologies for the sneezing. Richie started talking about air pollution and I couldn't stop. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, I, let, let's be clear. The, the government started by saying that they needed a temporary and targeted approach to this crisis. We said, no, you need a sustained and structural one. They said, look, the economy is going to snap back. And we said, no, it's going to last. Uh, this recession is going to last for years. They said, we need to hi hibernate the economy. We just need to get through this short bit. And, and then everything will bring it out of hibernation. Everything will be fine. It's not. Um, and of course, yeah, we've heard about a business led recovery uh, and of course a gas led recovery. So uh, unfortunately, while the governments, uh, you know, it's good that they ditched their obsession with the surplus early. It's good that they came out with a form of wage subsidy. It's good that they've tried to stimulate the economy. Ultimately, they still haven't embraced uh, anything like the kind of criteria uh, that we've floated in in the memorandum, they haven't uh, they haven't got a big picture view about how we're going to use this crisis to change things. And anyone who believes that things aren't going to change isn't paying attention. The economy is always in a state of flux. Go back ten years, go back twenty years. The economy looked very little like it does today. It's half a million people employed making coffee in Australia. Half a million. There's fifty thousand people working coal mines. There's 500,000 people working coffee. Well, 20 years ago, there wasn't. So uh, we're talking here about millions of people, millions of people losing their jobs or losing their hours of work, millions of people. Um, the transformation that will inevitably occur when those people get re-employed doing something different is, is enormous. And for, for the government to try and maintain the status quo, to try and either just keep the economy we had or say, oh, we're going to build gas pipelines and gas infrastructure. We've got Matt Canavan out today saying we should subsidise uh, coal-fired power stations, new ones, by taking all the risk off them. You know, so if someone wants to build a coal-fired power station and it turns out to be a dud idea, Matt Canavan, who is an economist and used to work at the Productivity Commission, an alleged free marketeer, is saying, let's, let's lock in a power station that'll generate energy for 50 years. Let's build that right now and, and take the risk off anyone who build it. So, yeah, the, the gas-led recovery is nonsense. I mean, you know, the gas industry employs even less people than the coal industry. Uh, but while having a gas-led recovery will do nothing to create jobs for millions of Australians, as you said, Ebony, it, it very well could create infrastructure uh, that, that lowers the costs of polluting for decades to come, or we just waste it. You know, we just build a giant gas pipeline that in five years time we don't need. That's not, that's not maximizing jobs in the short term or delivering lasting benefits. Um, the next uh, principle is, uh, and, the, and the last one um, after this we'll, we'll um play a short video for you and hopefully I can make the, the tech work on that because we don't often uh, do those types of things on these webinars. But the last criteria um, before we get to questions from the audience is that establishing clear criteria for spending as well as democratic accountability. And so obviously I talked about that the government has been spending enormous amounts of taxpayers' money and rightly so um, to put in place uh, the JobKeeper package, flawed though it is, to double the JobSeeker payment uh, for a period of six months. Many great things in that, but it's also established uh, the COVID Coordination Commission that's highly secretive, um, very opaque, very hard to see any transparency around that. Why is democratic accountability and some uh, transparency such an important part of this um, memorandum, Richard? Uh, because there's no right answer. 
um, go back to the beginning, we're going to spend hundreds of billions of dollars. We've already given enormous discretionary power to the treasurer to deploy more money than we've, we've given him more discretionary power than any of his predecessors. And rightly so. Okay. We, we know that we need to make quick decisions, uh, both from a health point of view and from an economic point of view. But the fact that we delegate decision-making to someone is different from them being free to do whatever they think is in their interests or their friends' interests. We trust our elected representatives to make decisions on our behalf. We entrust them with those responsibilities. Uh, we have to be able to scrutinise those decisions and evaluate them against clear criteria. So, you know, the New South Wales government has said they need to, need to, have no choice, uh, cut public sector pay to spend more money on building and construction, and they've said that'll create jobs. Well, where's the evidence? Where is the economic analysis on which that conclusion was based? Of all the things that the New South Wales government can do with $3 billion, where is the analysis that says of all the things they could do with $3 billion, building this particular road will create more jobs for the people that need those jobs than anything else? So it's okay that governments make decisions. We need them to. But those decision makers, those delegated decision makers that we've entrusted with our money should be accountable for all of those decisions down the track. And as you said, with secretive uh, processes uh, and very uh, you know, hand-picked membership of key advisory bodies, uh, the public who at the moment are showing quite a lot of faith in their governments uh, I think are going to lose a lot of faith in the capacity of governments to sustain us and protect us when those that we entrust to make these decisions uh, refuse to tell us what the criteria were, refuse to show us the evidence on which they made their decisions uh, and, and, and simply want to present what they did as a fait accompli. Um, Richie Merzian, before we go to the video and uh, questions from the audience, I just particularly wanted to ask about that um, NCCC, handpicked by the Prime Minister. It's now appeared before the Select Committee, um, but really we don't still know a huge amount about it or how it operates. Why is that concerning? It's concerning because it has been given a huge amount of power um, with very little guidance, very little accountability and hardly any transparency. Uh, and Nev Power, the head of this, this commission, um, handpicked by the Prime Minister, former Fortescue Medals head, sitting on the board of a gas company out west, um, has been paid over a quarter of a million dollars for his, um, for his expenses, including flying his private jet back and forth to Canberra. Um, he's been put in charge of this, and it's unclear why. Um, this, this is a huge task. It needs to be you know, done in the public interest. And you have someone who spent his entire career serving his private interests now taking this forward, joined by the head of Energy Australia, um, joined by a variety of other corporate executives as well. Um, the mandate's unclear. Uh, the accountability has been only forced upon them when the Australian Institute and many other organisations pushed for a Senate Select Committee to actually interact with all these agencies that are being charged. Uh, and gas and the gas-fired recovery has been one of the main recommendations pushed by uh, Nev Power, supported by the Energy Minister, and talked about um, through a number of proposals that are highly controversial. And just to end on gas in particular, the reason why gas is so dangerous is because it hasn't been discussed at the national level, much like coal has. Um, gas has all the marketing that, that would suit this current administration being in natural gas, but gas, gas reserves in Australia are huge. Um, gas emissions have often been underestimated. Gas jobs are few. In fact, it's probably one of the worst sectors you could invest in for job creation. The income from the gas industry has also been minimal in terms of the tax returns from most of these companies. Uh, and the corporate influence as demonstrated by this uh, is, obviously, um, is obviously from the highest levels. And so this is why all these things just add up to a really dangerous position. Thanks, Richie. Um, I'm going to play a short video now that the Australia Institute is going to launch today. So this is uh, your special preview before we uh, put it out into the world. Uh, so bear with me. Hopefully uh, this works. 
uh, share screen. When the Great Depression hit, our government responded by employing local workers and using local supplies to build things that last, like our iconic ocean pools. Now Australia has been hit even harder. We have the chance to kickstart our economy and build more of the things we wish we had more of. Not by freezing wages, cutting taxes and subsidising coal projects, but by investing in public projects that create jobs today and deliver benefits for decades to come. When everything shut down, we didn't have a choice. But when things restart, we will. Government must play a leadership role in restarting our economy. Nearly a century ago, our governments made investments that are still paying dividends today. Let's do our economy and our grandkids a favour and start building a new future today. Add your voice at tai.org.au. Authorised by E. Bennett, the Australia Institute, Canberra. Thank you very much. I hope that worked for everyone. Uh, we don't often do those, so <laughs> um, I was a little bit worried that wouldn't work, but we're launching that today uh, along with an open letter that uh, states these principles and asks people to, to sign on and, and back this style of reconstruction. So we'll send you all around a link to that along with uh, the video uh, that I've just played and the video of today's webinar um, after this. And it would be great if you, uh, you know, think that what we're talking about today makes sense, if you could add your name uh, along to that. And we will go now to questions from the audience. Just a reminder, if you'd like to ask your question, um, you can put up your hand and I'll try and call on you in a second so I can see Robert McLean, you've got your hand up there. Um, but the first question is from Janice Churchman, who asks, can we help solve climate change and provide jobs at the same time, including in North Queensland? I'll go first to you, Richard, and then to you, Richie. Yes. <laughs> you know, there's just no evidence that suggests we can't. I mean, it's, it, Australia has a very weird approach to economics and the economy we tell ourselves that without mining, we wouldn't have any jobs. Well, that's funny because Japan doesn't have any mines and it has a lot of jobs. Singapore doesn't have any mines, but has a lot of jobs. And it's 25 million people in Australia, only 50,000 work in coal mining. And the mining industry itself is determined to replace as many coal miners as it can with robot trucks. The people that tell us that we have to choose between environment and jobs are the same people who hope to cause climate change without employing anybody. Um, yeah, again, we're about to spend hundreds of billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars. We're about to use public policy to create jobs for millions of Australians. Let's think about this. We're about to try and help millions of people get new jobs. And we think that if 50,000 people stopped working in the coal industry, what well, you know the economy would fall over it, it it's absurd but i understand why people are so confused you know powerful people with excessive self-confidence have told us for decades that unless we're building new mines you're going to lose your job but uh the reality is the coal mining industry is desperate to sack its workforce robot trucks robot trains the quicker they can introduce them the quicker the happier they'll be you know, Adani themselves said they want to build a, a mine that's automated from pit to port. That's what the proponents of the mine have said. Um, when that technology rolls out through existing mines, we'll see job shedding in coal mines as rapid as we saw job shedding in, in call centres when they went overseas. Uh, we'll see job shedding faster than we saw when uh, digital cameras replaced, you know, photo development labs. It's, it's going to be terrible. Um, Richie, to you, and I just wondered also, um, it strikes me that often we put this in the context thinking that renewable energy jobs are supposed to solve unemployment. But if you can talk a little bit about the opportunities, but also, I guess, some of the problems in the way that we frame this problem. Mm. Um, building off Richard's point, the Climate of the Nation report that the Australian Institute did last year found that 
people overestimated the number of coal mining jobs in this country by over a factor of 20 and the income from the coal mining sector by over a factor of six. So it, it's just been a very successful marketing campaign from the mining industry uh, over decades to make Australians think about the inflated role that the mining and coal mining in particular plays in Australia. But even in North Queensland, I think it employs less than 2% of the workforce just in the most concentrated corner of the country. So there's far more people employed in the tourism sector that were demolished that, that we could be addressing. Um, and yet you haven't really heard many of those voices. No one from the tour tourism industry was appointed onto the National COVID Commission. So it really is a selective approach built on years of successful marketing by those who have no real public interest here. But whether that will be replaced with renewables is a different question. So even though there's three times more renewable energy jobs than there are jobs in coal and gas fired power stations, they're spread out. Uh, many of them are at the front end of the industry in terms of solar panel installation on houses. Uh, and so you don't have the same kind of concentration, the, the same kind of skills necessarily either. Um, it's often but, small business people, electricians, for example, install a lot of solar panels. Yeah, that's right. And, and sometimes you, you don't even need an electrician to install some of the panels as well. Uh, and so even though there's more people who install solar panels than work in coal and gas fired power stations, uh, it, it's dispersed and it doesn't have the same kind of concentration and skill set. Uh, and so a lot of the jobs, a lot of the replacements will happen in industries that we haven't really um, built yet or, or in some things we haven't thought of. So, for example, the offshore wind industry doesn't exist in Australia, but it could. And a lot of those jobs can actually transfer over from offshore coal and gas exploration into offshore wind to build floating windmills uh, in the ocean. And you have the, the Maritime Union backing that proposal down with the Star of the South, the big proposal down in Victoria. So there's some industries that we just haven't explored yet and some that will come from outside the renewable energy sector to provide these jobs of the future. Uh, but part of it is actually canvassing how that can happen and, and backing it. Um, Richard, the next question I think will start with you. It's from Chris Toomey who asks, most of the people who lost jobs were women and young people. How do we ensure that the stimulus creates job for, for those people? Uh, it's obvious, Chris, through big construction projects. Um, <laughs> everyone, everyone knows that big construction projects employ lots and lots of women. Um, uh, look, it, it's, it's such an important question. Again, we've got to take a people-centric approach here. We've got to look at who's lost their jobs, what skills they have, where they live, what jobs they could do in the short period of time that we've got to help them. It's ridiculous to say, oh, well, someone could go off and do a civil engineering degree and in three to five years, they too could be helping to build the bridge. So yeah, Australia Institute's done quite a lot of research on this. Uh, it's all up on our website, but women have been hardest hit by the recession. They've disproportionately lost their jobs. They've disproportionately lost their hours of work. Uh, and, I think most importantly, what our research shows is uh, when you look at the government's response, for each industry, you can not only talk about how many jobs they create per million dollars spent, but you can talk about how many jobs for women they create per dollar spent. And a million dollars spent on construction creates 0.2 jobs for women. 0.2 jobs for women for every million we spend on construction. In education, that number is 10. For every million dollars we spend on education, we create 10 jobs for women. So uh, this data is freely available. It's from the Australian Bureau of Statistics website. We've been saying this for quite some time. So not only, again, sure, go build stuff. It's good. But when we focus our stimulus spending on construction, we just need to all look ourselves in the eye or look each other in the eye and say, we know that's not going to create many jobs and we really know it's not going to create many jobs for women. And it's not, if building infrastructure in Sydney or Melbourne will do nothing to help the tourism sector in North Queensland that's been decimated. And, and this, this crisis has hit the Queensland tourism, Queensland economy far harder than, than, than delaying the Adani mine ever could. So we, we need to be honest about this. And yeah, anyone that thinks or anyone that says that construction will create a lot of jobs for women or the benefits will trickle down, they're just making shit up. Like, let's, let's be honest, they're just making shit up. Um, 
when we employ nurses, they go to the shops and spend money. When we employ construction workers, they go to the shops and spend money. Everyone's pay packet trickles down. But when we spend money on construction, most of the money goes on concrete and capital equipment. When we spend money on services, most of the money goes to people. Let's put people first. Thanks, Richard. Um, the next question is from Robert McLean. Are you on the line there? Can you hear me? I can hear, I can hear you, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, what's your question for the panel? Oh, thank you, Ebony. I really appreciate these wonderful webinars. My question is to Richard. Um, I agree with you that we are rich enough to do what we choose. I agree with that. But how do we convince our decision makers? Like I live in an electorate that has a National Party member and it's like talking to a brick wall. So how do I convince our people that we can do whatever we choose? Um, well, maybe you can't. It's a democracy. We have to respect that. And in a democracy, we, we don't all get our way. Um, but let, let's be clear that the National Party are very happy to see $10 billion spent on an inland rail line. The National Party supported $7 billion second Sydney airport. The National Party support $300 billion worth of tax cuts at the last election. The National Party don't mind spending money. They just don't want to spend it on you. Well, they don't want to spend it on the projects you like. Uh, and that's okay, because again, that's how democracy works. But what we all need to do is get better at, at calling this out for what it is. What conservatives are really good at doing is saying, I, I agree with you. I, I love to spend money on your project. It's just that the surplus, it's just causes the debt. So I agree with you in principle, which is the oldest political trick in the book. I agree with you in principle, but in practice, oh, just don't have any money. And that's bullshit. Like what we just have to say is, sorry, you just voted for $300 billion worth of tax cuts. The reason that you say we don't have any money is you gave it to your friends in the form of tax cuts rather than spend it on me and the things I wanted. Like we just have to be honest with ourselves and not fall for them agreeing with us in principle or not fall for nonsensical arguments about budget surpluses and certainly not fall for, uh, for the idea that they themselves have some problem with spending public money. They love spending public money on their friends. Um, the next question is for you, Richie. Uh, Chandra Shah asks, climate change requires global cooperation. Given the fragmentation of the global order as evidenced by the reaction to the COVID-19 crisis, what are the chances of global action on climate change given the very short time frame we have to act? Hmm. Well, climate change has been rare in the multilateral or in the UN space in that the Paris Agreement has almost universal uh, coverage and buy-in and every country around the world, almost 200, has taken on a target or taken on their, their share of how they want to reduce emissions. Uh, and I, I think we shouldn't underestimate how powerful this can be. And a good example of that is at the last UN Climate Conference in Madrid in December, Australia tried its hardest to make sure that it could use these dodgy Kyoto credits to meet over half their emission reduction target. Uh, most countries pushed back on that. And the only reason uh, it wasn't dealt with is because the whole chapter that they were dealing with fell over and was pushed to the next climate agreement. But Australia was isolated from public global pressure to do the right thing. And I think this is really why the international system can, uh, to some extent, provide a, a certain level of influence and pressure that, that often we struggle with here domestically. So I think if we see how we can engage in this space and communicate what Australia is doing honestly, um, then actually the international space could provide another lever to do that. Another example was in the Pacific Island Forum where our neighbours pushed Australia to actually bring forward a long-term climate strategy this year, which the government doesn't want to do because when it does, it, it'll demonstrate that it's actually not on track to meet its Paris long-term target by 2050, um, that it's not on track to actually build the infrastructure to transition the economy. Um, so the international space has a lot to give. And I think, I think there's, there's still room to continue to press that space in order to keep Australia accountable to an international audience, not just its domestic one. Thanks, Richie. Uh, I've got another two questions here that I think are linked. So uh, again, Chris Toomey asks about um, 
an Aboriginal human services development strategy, creating local jobs in Aboriginal community controlled organisations in the care economy. And then there was another question that talked about how can we incorporate Indigenous knowledge that can add significantly to our ability to create a more sustainable economy rather than uh, just talking about a process of, of truth telling. Richard, I wondered if you could speak to the, the care economy and the opportunities um, in, in there, in that space. Yeah, no, thank you. Very important questions. And last week I uh, spoke at a webinar in Western Australia on, 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 on the importance, not just the importance, the effectiveness of, of having a loud Indigenous voice uh, in the, the health response to, to, to COVID-19. Uh, not just in response to the to the, the immediate effects of COVID-19, but uh, more generally. Uh, and tomorrow is it, Ed, that we're talking with Fiona Stanley. Um, uh, so the Australian, our, our next webinar uh, kind of looks at this issue in, in a lot of detail. But That's look, right. basic, basically there's, there's, overwhelming, uh, there's overwhelming public health and epidemiological evidence that suggests that in dealing with any community, Indigenous or otherwise, if you talk to people before you design solutions for them, they're more effective. But in addition to that general rule, there is just so much evidence in Australia that when we roll out programs that have had uh, serious engagement with the desires, the concerns, the priorities and the culture of Indigenous communities, they're far more effective than often what happens like when John Howard put boots on the ground, literally, uh, with the NT intervention uh, back when he was uh, trying to win an election. So, look, we, a, a voice for Indigenous people is not just, a, uh, I shouldn't say just, in addition to being uh, such a, a, an important part of our uh, of our community and our culture and, uh, and, uh, and our democracy, if you want to do good targeted health policy, uh, or any development, community development programs, uh, we have to take the local community voice into account. And sadly, we've, we've failed to do that uh, over decades. Uh, thanks, Richard. And you're right, I'll give the details very shortly, but tomorrow at 11 a.m. we do have four Aboriginal health professionals and we'll be talking about the success um, of the Aboriginal-led community health response. Lynn McIver, do I have you there for our final question to the panel? Yes, thank you, Ebony. Um, look, I have uh, always been pushing a barrow about unpaid productivity, um, particularly the unpaid productivity of many women. And uh, we have seen through the COVID uh, crisis that the caring uh, uh, and the specialised uh, jobs that most women tend to find themselves in, in education, nursing, etc., have been vital uh, in you know, getting us out of the situation. Um, and I'd just like to know when and if um, economists are going to be able to actually put a figure on that unpaid productivity, as it would appear that more and more women are going to lose, have lost their jobs and will be out of the paid workforce, but certainly will still be working. Thanks, Lynn. Richard, that one might be one for you. Yeah, look, absolutely, Lynn, you're spot on. Um, look, the, the sad fact is economists understand exactly what you said, and there's literally nothing in an economics textbook that says that unpaid work uh, is, 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 is not important. Uh, it, it is just a feat of politics that we've decided to obsess about a subset, a portion of economic activity uh, in the form of, of, of the paid market. That's not economics. Economics is about production and output and distribution. Now, if I grow my own carrots at home and peel my carrots and make some carrot soup, uh, that's production, that's economics. Uh, now, if I swap my carrot soup for some eggs from your backyard, that's exchange, that's markets and work. We're just using barter, not cash. But we've told ourselves and we've been told by again, overconfident people that perhaps don't know as much about economics as they think, that what happens in the market sphere of our life is somehow all important and what happens elsewhere in our life isn't. That is not economics. Uh, and of course, you know, we only invented gross domestic product, the indicator, GDP, we only invented it post-World War II. 
how did how did Napoleon conquer Europe? <laughs> how how did the Egyptians build pyramids? It's not like uh, it's there's nothing in economic theory or history that suggests if we don't capture something in our national accounts uh, that it's not worth something or doesn't count. Uh, I, I did write a, an essay years ago called Spreadsheets of Power uh, that does look at these things. Uh, it was in the monthly magazine. Um, but look, big picture, there's no economic or democratic uh, or cultural reason to ignore unpaid work. It's just a choice. It's just a choice and it's a terrible choice and it comes at huge consequences. And, and we can tell ourselves things are getting better because the number's getting bigger uh, and we can ignore really important, valuable things that people do because there's no market price for them. But just because there's not a price for it doesn't mean it's worthless. Thanks, Richard. Uh, we might wrap it up there. Thank you so much, everyone, for your wonderful questions today. As always, sorry that we couldn't get to them all. But just a reminder, we are launching that video along with the reconstruction memo today. And so keep an eye on your inbox because we'll email you not only with a link to the video recording of today's webinar, but so you can uh, have, check out that video again. And uh, if you're inclined, also sign up um, to those uh, reconstruction principles. But thank you very much, Richard Dennis and Richie Merzian for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. And please, if you can join us tomorrow, the 25th of June at 11 a.m., where we will be talking about the success of Aboriginal-led health responses to the pandemic with Leslie Nelson, the CEO of the Southwest Aboriginal Medical Service, Professor Sandra Eads, Dean of Curtin Medical School, Associate Professor Dan McCauley, Director of the Centre for Improving Health Services for Aboriginal Children at Edith Cowan University, as well as Francine Eads, who is Chair of the Durbel Yerrigan Health Service. They'll be in conversation with Richard Dennis and Professor Fiona Stanley, uh, Australian of the Year and all around legend. Um, that will be tomorrow and you can register for that if you haven't already at tai.org.au forward slash webinars or from the homepage of our website. If you are in a position to donate to our end of financial year appeal, all donations to our research fund are tax deductible and every donation is appreciated. We don't receive uh, any funding from political parties and we do rely heavily on donations from people like you. So those would all be most appreciated if you're in a position to make a donation and every little bit helps. And please make sure that you're subscribed to our Follow the Money podcast. Uh, in the latest episode, Matt Grudnoff, our senior economist, talks about jobs for the boys and why uh, putting a lot of money into schemes like the Home Builder program really only benefit men, even though it's women who have been losing jobs uh, much faster than men in this recession. You can subscribe to Follow the Money on iTunes or wherever you normally listen to podcasts. And if you like it, please give us a review because it helps other people to find the podcast as well. And finally, make sure that you're staying 1.5 metres away. Keep washing those hands and stay safe out there, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, and we'll see you hopefully tomorrow. Thanks, Ed. Thanks. Bye.